We're going to get ready to prepare for our morning offering. And if you need an offering envelope, just lift your hand up. We'll be sure to get an offering envelope in your hand, those of you that need one. Can I get a little bit more volume? I just keeps going in and out for some reason. That's, that's it, so hi. Okay, all right, we'll just have to deal with that. All right, let me just go ahead and switch mics. All right, there we go. So if you do need an offering envelope, just lift your hands up. We'll be sure to get one in your hand. Um, then again, if you're making out checks, you can simply make them out to RPM. And those of you that may be watching by streaming video on YouTube, if you're desirous of being a blessing to this particular ministry, you can simply bless us uh, with any amount of check or whatever, money order, and you can send it to RPM at P.O. Box 594 Winston, Georgia 30187. <clears throat> Again, that's RPM, P.O. Box 594, Winston, Georgia, 30187. And again, uh, all of your uh, deductions are, uh, you know, they count for tax redu deductions at the end of the year, of course, and we'll give you a statement at the end of the year. And we're just believing that God's kingdom is getting ready to take off and soar like we've never seen before. In the midst of the COVID virus and everything else that we have going on right now, God's going to come out of this thing. We're going to come out of this thing as, as though you can't smell any smoke at all. It'll, it'll, it'll be just like the three men that were put in the fiery furnace. They're going to come out unscathed. How many believe that? Amen. I know it's ugly right now. It's in disarray right now. We don't know if we'll ever get back to what we call normalcy again, but that's okay. God's got a ram in the bush. When he made this planet, he knew that this day would come. He knows the outcome of the rest of the days that are ahead of us. So just keep in mind, as long as Jesus Christ is sitting on that throne, everything is going to be all right. Amen? Amen. So go ahead and lift those offerings up if you have them ready right now. We're going to pray over them and we're going to believe that God's going to breathe his breath upon them and that the blessings of Almighty God are going to come. The blessings of Abraham that he promised us that are in covenant with him are going to come over us and overtake us. And these are just seeds of many harvests that will come and that are going to be, uh, in, in fact, ready for us when God's timing is there. I mean, you, you can bet, rest assured that when you plant a seed into the ground, it may die, which seems like a negative, but that's a positive. Because through death comes a harvest. Yeah. Once that seed dies, it brings about a bountiful, plentiful harvest. And your name is written on it. Amen? Yeah. Let's lift it up before the Lord right now as we go before his presence in prayer. Thank you so very much, Lord, for this opportunity to be able to give back to the kingdom of God as you have blessed us, Lord. We know without a doubt that, Lord, this is your day. This is a holy day, and God, you've given us seed to plant, and as we sow this seed, we pray that you breathe upon our gift, whether it be our tithe or our offering, Father. Breathe upon it. Bless us back 100-fold in return, Father. Lord, many times we're looking for monetary blessings, but God, sometimes you give us health blessings. Sometimes you give us blessings in the area of relationships. Father, we're not stipulating what type of blessing. We're just saying, Lord, we want to be obedient. We ask that you simply breathe upon it. Let your will be uh, returned unto us. And those that are in need, Father, this may be their last straw. They're in a dire straits concerning their finances. Breathe upon that situation and give that person a miracle as they need it even now. Work it out for them. Put the to Take the spirit of fear and doubt and unbelief away, God, and breathe into them the spirit of peace that they might walk in the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Father, we're so careful to give your name all the glory, praise, and honor. We ask these blessings and prayers in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the praise team if y'all, first and foremost, let's give them a hand clap for what they've done in our midst, how they walk and come in heavy day. We're going to ask if I could just borrow this time, and y'all go ahead and take a seat. We have a special video presentation that we want to uh, share with you in lieu of Black History Month. You know, we hadn't, yeah. we hadn't talked about it all uh, month, but we wanted to save the best for last. So we have a very short video presentation, and we want you to, if you will, focus your attention on the two screens, and after which I'll be back with the word of the Lord for this morning. Amen? Amen. Can I... Can you hit those lights for us so we can see a little bit clearer? Just the, just the lights right here in the front. Thanks.
When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. And yet, the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of the country and the time, were a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promised glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So, while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert. How could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce, and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation, because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens, but one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind swept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked south. We will rebuild 
reconcile and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country. Our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn balloons as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Well, we've got something to be proud of, don't we? We come from a stock of some well-refined, powerful men and women of God over the years. And they only give us one month, but that's okay. Let's just take advantage of, the, uh, advantage of that one month and ride it like the wind. <laughs> and thank God for the achievements of us as African Americans and what we've brought to this nation and this country and this world at large. And to God be the glory because he's the one that is the wind beneath glory. our wings. Amen. Glory. He's the one that made it possible. I remember meeting where in 1890, about 20% of African Americans in the year 1890 knew how to read. Yeah. And between 1890 and 1910, 90% of African Americans knew how to read. Do you know why? Mm -hmm. They wanted to learn to read one book, yes. yeah. the word of the Lord. Yeah. Ain't that amazing? Yeah. And Jesus Christ is the one that has brought us from where we are and where will continue to bring us as to where we need to go, amen? amen. Not only just African Americans, but the world at large. We need to go forward in the name of the Lord, Amen. proclaiming the kingdom of Almighty God. So let's just give God another hand clap of applause. Just what we've done as a nation and as a people. Amen. Happy Polka Dot Day. Uh, I mean, happy Christmas. All right. Well, we're going to, uh, how many are ready for the word of God this morning? Take it in. Let me ask that one more. How many are ready for the word of God this morning? Yeah. All right, well, we're still speaking on the seven churches of Asia. I don't know about you all, but it's been a blessing to me. Oh, oh, y'all hadn't done the offering yet? I thought y'all had already taken that on up. Tell me why you all come on up here. Let's, let's sing your little song and let me just go ahead and take a little seat until they sing and then I'll be back with the word of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Great. 
direction as we pray. Father, we thank you so very much, Lord, for this opportunity and this time to spread the word of God abroad, Lord Jesus. Lord, as I stand before the sacred pulpit to speak not only about you, but Lord, to speak on behalf of you, Father. I pray that you would remove flesh completely out of the way and Holy Spirit step in and take full control. Speak to our hearts, change our actions and our ways and our minds, God. Broaden our understanding. Let the spirit of wisdom and power and anointing flow through us, Lord. And God, I pray that as this word goes forth in the atmosphere, Lord Jesus, any kind of demonic activity that may be contrary to your word, whether it be negativity, negative thoughts, fears, unbeliefs, doubts, whatever, God, I pray that you would put to naught all of those things. And God, let the stone of Jesus Christ be the stone that will squash the enemy in his tracks. Father, I pray that this word would go forth unscathed, Lord, that it would go forth in power, the anointing that you would breathe upon each one of us. Yes. Lord, enlarge our territory mentally, physically, emotionally, God. And let the word produce the results in our hearts and in our lives, Lord, by confirming your word with signs following. Whether it be a confirmation of something we needed to hear. Yes. Whether it be a spiritual uh, 
awakening in our hearts, Lord God, or a physical healing in our physical bodies, Jesus. Confirm your word, I pray, with signs following. And Father, we're so careful to give all the glory, the thanks, and the praise to you. Because, Lord, you and you alone deserve all the glory, praise, and honor. That no flesh would glory in your presence. But that all of this goes to you. And we thank you for it in advance. And we praise you for all of the results. These blessings and prayers we do ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. amen. Well, I'm going to ask if you will to turn in your Bibles to the book of um, Revelation. The last book of your Bible. And we're still ministering. Part two of the church of Thyatira. There are seven churches of Revelation or of Asia Minor, and we've ministered three thus far. And last week we touched a, a little bit of the area of the church of Thyatira, but today we're going to go forward and move forward in Thyatira because we still have three more churches to get to. And I thank God because I know God is speaking to hearts because He's even speaking to my heart as your pastor. Even through these messages, I've learned and gained more understanding and information just in the study of this thing. And it, 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 when you see the totality of what the Lord is trying to do, it broadens your understanding. It lifts you up to a degree where you can't go back to the condition you were before. Amen. It stretches you. Amen. And anytime you take a rubber band and you stretch that thing for a period of time, the molecules in that rubber band will adjust. So that when you let it go, it won't be that small little rubber band it was before, but it would have been stretched to another level. And that's what God wants to do in your lives this morning is to stretch you, Amen. bring you to another level of understanding. Yeah. Because when we understand more, we walk a little bit taller with our shoulders up a little yeah. bit higher, knowing and understanding who we really are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. So the letter of, uh, of, of the church of to Thyatira, first and foremost, I want to start off. I told you that Thyatira was a highly uh, commercialized center of trade and it was also used as a military garrison. And the city of Thyatira, in comparison to the church of Ephesus, or the city of Ephesus, the city of Smyrna, you know, the city of Pergamum, that big, huge city that was on a big, gigantic, huge hill that could be seen for miles and miles away. This was a little town in comparison. It wasn't a big, illustrious city, but it was a town. And it was a military garrison. And one of the main reasons that historians tell us that the city of Thyatira was even built, it was built to keep people out of Pergamum. It was like a, a, it was like a doorway to Pergamum. So you would have to pass Thyatira to get to Pergamum, which was 25 miles away from Thyatira, the city of Thyatira. So they had a lot of the wealth of Pergamum was stored at a safe place there in Thyatira. Thyatira had a major commodity which was textiles or fabric or cloth material. And we told you that last week in order for you to be a part of any type of job situation, you had to be a part of a union called guiles. These, these guiles were things like a trade union. It was sort of like a, you know, a union that you had to sign up for and anybody in any trade had to be a part of this guy. You couldn't just work a regular job without being a part of it. You had to be exclusive, as an, exclusive an exclusive member of a particular guy. The thing about it is that their God that they served there in the city of Thyatira was the God Apollo. Apollo called himself, or the, the parishioners, and the followers of Apollo called Apollo the son of God. Mm. That was his title. He was the son of God. I mean, in their eyes at least. And so in order for a Christian to hold down a job, you had to be a part of these gals and, and, and uh, these guilds. I keep calling them gals, but they're guilds. And the guild, which is the labor union, uh, in order to be a member of it, you had to participate in idolatry worship. You had to participate in offering up incense to this particular god Apollo. You also had to petition, uh, uh, participate in some of the festivities that they would uh, do, and this would be sexual perver perversive type activity going on right there at the temple door. You had to sleep with prostitutes, and you know they had orgies and all type of drunkenness and different things of that nature going on, and you couldn't get away from it. If you're a part of this guild, you had to be a part of the festivities as well. So Christians had a serious task. They, even, they either had to follow Jesus all the way 
they had to either compromise or not follow uh, the, the dictates of uh, this particular uh, God, Apollo, at all. So, so it was hard on Christians because if they didn't participate, they were excommunicated. They were ostracized. They were kicked to the side. They were kicked to the curb. So Christians had it hard because they had to make their minds up as to whether they wanted to do this. You couldn't participate in anything that had anything to do with uh, uh, so, so, social living or culture in the city of Thyatira at all unless you were part of one of these guilds. Keep that in mind. So now Jesus comes to this particular church that he planted right there in Thyatira because Thyatira was a really powerful uh, military garrison as we had established earlier. And in order for the word of God to go forth, you had a lot of transitions going on between Thyatira and Pergamum. Lots of people would congregate in this city. It was known again for its textiles or its fabrics. In fact, in the book of uh, Acts, you read where Paul the Apostle came across a woman by the name of Lydia who was a seller of purple. And the Bible specifically says she was from Thyatira. She was from this particular city right here. Now, the church that Jesus built with his name put on it, they were a, a group of people that were faithful and they continued to do certain things that the Lord had, had instructed them to do, even so much so that Jesus commended them for even doing what he told them to do. And they went and took that thing a couple of steps further. So he commended them. But then there were some, some areas that really made the other three churches look, look uh, like, like choir boys almost. Now, the church of Smyrna wasn't a church that was rebuked by the Lord at all, but Ephesus was, and the church of Pergamum were definitely rebuked sharply by the Lord. But out of all of the seven letters to all of the seven churches, this letter to the church of Thyatira was the most lengthy letter. He had a lot to say about this church, and he had to straighten some things out before they could become a church that would end up in ruins completely. So now, I'm going to give you later on a little bit the timetable of all of these churches. I told you that the seven churches of Revelation were literal churches during that time. They were established by Jesus himself, and they were written to letters through the apostle John on an island called Patmos. And John had these letters to get out to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And they were present-day churches, but then there are seven church eras that come out of each one of these seven churches. They didn't just start right there. Jesus' words were this in the book of Revelation. These things must shortly come to pass. Folk needed to hear comforting words right then and there. But also, they were for the church that would come out of these seven churches. Because these seven churches were emblematic of the seven eras that the church would go through. And I have, I, I'm here to tell you that we're in one of those churches today. I mentioned it before. We, we'll come there and talk about that in further detail. But right now, let's get straight to the letter in Revelation chapter 2 to this particular church. It says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. Remember Jesus, we talked about this last week. If you want to check the video out last week, you can go on YouTube and look at it. But we talked about how they called Apollo the son of God. And Jesus, notice how he addresses himself in the beginning of this letter. He, he puts the focus back on himself. Hey, he is false. I am the son of God. Amen. Not Apollo, but me. These are reasons why he says it. To the angel of the church of Thyatira write, these things saith the son of God. And then he goes on to say, who has eyes like unto flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. Brass and metals were a commodity there in that particular region as well. So they had a lot to do with, when he said fine brass as far as his feet, you know, they were refined like brass. They could identify with that. But those flames of fire in his eyes are eyes of judgment that he's looking down upon this church because there's some things going on that he's not pleased with. Remember, these are the seven churches that Jesus himself established. Not anybody else outside of him, but he himself established these seven churches. Remember the number seven simply means completion. In other words, he, he, he has the totality of everything that he's got to do has, has been literally installed in each one of these churches. And he says in the book of Revelation chapter one, I am walking in the midst of you guys. 
I see what is going on. I know everything you're going through. And that's just not the church, but that's our lives as well. Amen. You got to understand God sees everything you're going through. He sees all of the ways you and I act, the things that we do in our flesh, the things that are displeasing to him, even the things that we do that are pleasing to him that nobody else sees us doing. And it's as though we didn't get any credit for it. But Jesus sees it. It didn't go un un unrecognized by the Lord. He knows every work we've done. Amen. Understand this. You're never alone. Stuff that you do in the secret, he already promised you in his word. It shall be brought to the light. Yes. Now, you can't do anything that is, is going to be hidden from God. Nothing you can do to hide anything from God. He knows your thoughts before we even think our thoughts. Now, how can we escape a God that has that type of preeminence over us? He's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent all at the same time. Yeah. Satan can't do all of that. Only God can. Yes, Lord. So we serve a wonderful God. And he goes on to say in verse 19, I know thy works, thy charity. They had a powerful evangelism ministry going forth. He says, I see this. I know this. I know your service and your faith and your patience. I know thy works. And the last to be more than the first. Your last works have exceeded the works you started off doing. I see that and I take, I've taken notice. I know what you're doing. And then keep in mind, this church was on an upward trajectory because Jesus commended them for that. Verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou suffereth that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. Now understand this, she calls herself a prophetess. Many people have callings of God on their lives. Some were sent, but then others went. Not everybody has a call of God on your life. Just because you got a business card with Prophet Butterball on there, or Prophet Knickknack, or whatever you want to call yourself, a prophet, prophetess, you know, Lulu, or whatever, it doesn't mean that that gift or that call of God is on your life. Somebody may have prophesied in a church service that you're to be a prophet or you're to be an evangelist or a pastor or a teacher. And just because one person gave you a prophecy, people have taken that thing and ran with it. They didn't have no training whatsoever. Not as though you've got to have the training because Jesus himself can purposely download stuff into your spirit just like he did Paul the Apostle. Yes. If he has called you. Amen. But many people were sent by God and others just flat went. Yes. And not everybody that has a title has been called of God. Yes. Don't you marvel over the fact that people can speak words of eloquence and big words, 10 gallon jaw breaking words that impress everybody and it doesn't do anything for you at all. Listen, don't be impressed by that because sometimes people have been, uh, they went instead of were sent. Mm -hmm. But when God sends somebody, you'll know it's the hand of God yeah. because God's hand will be on them and you'll see the anointing in that person's yeah. life. Yeah. God will send individuals and just because a person goes out there, even when he sends you, you can make blunders sometimes when you start off yeah. and it doesn't mean you're false. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It means you've got to grow. Yeah, we all have to go through a situation where we've got to grow. We have to be matured and we grow as we go. Amen. Understand that. It's not like God sends you because you've got it 100% together. If that were the case, then he couldn't ever send us until we get to heaven in a new body. <laughs> then we'd be 100% ready. Amen. But he uses broken, marred people like us to put his transcendent glory in and to put us on the front lines, even people that have been scarred, marked. We're not perfect. We don't have the 100% together. I would love to tell people that because the first time a Christian who ministers to an individual shares the gospel of Jesus Christ, people are looking at that person through the lens of a microscope or a telescope, yeah. waiting for them to make the, the smallest little mistake. And the first thing they're going to say is, hey, I thought, I thought you were a Christian. Yeah. Well, I am a Christian. But how many know Christians are human? Amen. God is perfect, but he uses imperfect vessels. The Holy Ghost is perfect, but the people he uses are imperfect. So you don't have to have a 100% together and think, well, you know, let me get myself together first. Then I'll let the Lord you. No, no, if you can get yourself together, you'd be called God. Because only he can do that. You and I are scarred and marked because of sin. That's why there's an inner battle going on on the inside of us. Flesh against spirit. We're warring back and forth. Spirit against flesh. 
the one you feed the most is the one that's going to win this battle. Amen. Amen. But notice this lady who was a prophetess. She, she's not a prophetess. The Bible says she called herself a prophetess. It didn't say Jesus sanctioned this because, in fact, he did not. She's false. You're going to discover that in just a few minutes. She called herself a prophetess. So some ministers that are behind the pulpit call themselves pastors or call themselves evangelists or call themselves prophets or apostles. But guess what? They're not in some cases. Just because they have a title doesn't mean that they have been sent by God is what I'm trying to simply inform you. It doesn't mean that everybody that has a title actually operates in that gift. So understand, in this case, the Bible says right here in verse 20, she called herself a prophet. Yeah. And then it goes on to say to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her, listen, Jesus says, I gave her space to repent of her fornications. I gave her time to repent. Mm. I held back my wrath. I waited it out. I convicted her. I sent sign upon sign, confirmation of sign upon confirmation of sign for her to get it together. And it says, and she repented not. Verse 22. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the heart. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. You better believe he will. That's why we've got to get it together because God judges us based upon our works in this thing called life. Verse 24. But I say unto you and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. He's talking about the remnant of people that didn't give in to this false teaching. There's always a remnant. The remnant is those that are left over. When battle time comes and testing time comes and periods of you know persecution comes, some people give in, some give up, some run away, some renounce Christ, but then you got those that are in there all the way. They're ride or die buddies. They'll be there all the way. That's called the remnant. Those are the ones that God really can use in a powerful way. He doesn't really need a whole lot of folks. All God needs is just a few good men and women that have enough potency of him in their heart, they can get their modern day world turned upside down for Jesus. Do we have any takers here today? Are you one of them? Amen. 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 Somebody shout hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Then he goes on to say, uh, he says, uh, the, the latter part of verse number 24, I will put upon you none of, no other burden, verse 25, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. I won't give you any more of a burden that you, than you already have. You just hold fast to what you're dealing with right now until I come. That's what Jesus is saying to those who have not given in to these false teachings. In verse 26, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with the rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers even as I receiveth of my father and I will give him the morning star he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches let me reread Revelation chapter 2 verses 24 through 29 I want to reread it from the message Bible in verse 24 it says the rest of you thy tyrants who have nothing to do with this outrage who scorn this playing around with the devil that gets paraded as profundity, be assured I will not make life any harder for you than it already is. Hold on to the truth you have until I get there. Here's the reward I have for every conqueror, everyone who keeps it, refusing to get up, give up. You'll rule the nations. Your shepherd king rules as firm as an iron staff, their resistance fragile as clay pots. This was the gift of my father that he gave me. I will pass it along to you. And with it, the morning star. Are your ears awake? Listen. Listen to the wind words the spirit bloweth through the churches. Somebody shout amen. amen. 
Okay, now we got a situation here. We got a church that is a, a thriving church right in the middle of a military garrison. Jesus Christ's name is in it. This church is doing wonderful works. They've, they've, they've done outstanding things in the area of evangelism and giving and blessing the community and you know ministering and holding fast to the truths of God word, God's word. At least some of them have. But then within this church is a woman that goes under the name of Jezebel. Somebody say Jezebel. Jezebel. Now this probably was not this lady's literal name. I wouldn't think anybody would name their child Jezebel. That's like somebody naming their child Satan. Hey, come here, Satan. Come here. Mama loves you. Come here, boy. Where you been? I mean, can you imagine calling your son Satan or Lucifer? I mean, some people may be crazy enough to do that if they worship the devil. But anybody in their right mind wouldn't even go there. So these people, this, I don't think her name was Jezebel, but yet she operated and she functioned as a woman that was a woman out of order, like the Jezebel in the Old Testament. Not only did she function like that woman, she had the same spirit upon her. Maybe this was a nickname given to her. I don't know. But this is what this woman thought she was doing. She thought that she was actually helping the children of God out in this particular church of Thyatira. Because keep in mind, they were ostracized. They were rejected. They couldn't go anywhere, do anything, unless they were a part of these guilds. And if you were part of the guilds, it meant you had to intermingle with false gods, and Christians don't do that. That's a part of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Remember, mixture, Jesus hates it. I would that you were either cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. He don't want mixture. Keep in mind, you're a child of God. You gotta understand, child of God, who you are. You're just not somebody that just got saved and just living in this world, living it up, you know, and, and intermingling with everything and everybody. No, my friend, you represent Jesus Christ. You are a target simply because you named the name of the Lord. No wonder all hell comes your way. No wonder people harass you on your job. No wonder you get all the bad luck, it seems like, that is passed around. You're the last of everything. You run out of everything when it comes your turn. People just close their doors on you. Sometimes the loan is rejected. Sometimes things don't go your way. And you wonder, well, Lord, why? What have I done? God, you had done anything but just accept Jesus Christ. All hell sees a target on your back. Satan's throwing everything he can at you because he knows you're a child of God. He knows you carry the weight of the whole heaven on your back. He knows that the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the 24 elders, yeah. the great crowd of witnesses, everything in heaven's behind you. He knows that everywhere you go when you name the name of Jesus, things take place. God knows you're somebody special. You're a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy generation. My friend, God has taught us out of darkness into his marvelous light. You're somebody great. You're not ordinary. You're extraordinary. you got the glory of God on your life. You need to strong your shoulders up, up even higher. Lift up your head on these gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Somebody shout glory to God. Shout glory to God. Shout glory. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. You are somebody special, child of God. You're just not a nobody. You say, well, I don't have a big title. I, I'm just a church goer. You're just a church goer. Let me tell you something, Mr. Church goer. Miss Church goer, you got the name of Jesus inside of you. That makes you somebody special. You came from a different breed. You're from the kingdom of God. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. Why are you looking down on yourself? Why are you going back? Why are you dumbing down to everybody else's level? You're somebody special. People treat you the way they are because they're jealous of the anointing of God on your life. They're jealous of the blessings of Abraham on your life. That's why all hell hits you from every direction and every angle. You've been marked by God. That's something to shout about. And here you are like a chicken going around here in unwanted red light districts. Houses of ear repute and places like that hanging around places Christians have no business being in. And that's, that, that was the, the call of that particular town of Thy Tower. These Christians didn't have anything to do with it, but then this Jezebel woman says, hey, I got an idea. Why don't we do this? We can have the best of both worlds. We can simply go out, and out down, down there with the gills, be a part of that little stuff, but you just say in your heart, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. Even when you sacrifice it to this Apollo God, pretend it's Jesus. Say, close your eyes and say, I'm sacrificing this unto the Lord Jesus. But you're sacrificing it to the God. But she's letting them compromise. And she's telling them to go ahead and commit whoredom. You can be forgiven. God sees your heart. You gotta live in 
to work. You got to eat. You got to have a job. You got to function in life. So she's letting them know it's okay, church. Let's do it. We still come together on the, the, the Lord's day. We still worship and praise God. We still give him glory. But then you can still go out there and function in life without having been ostracized or forgotten about. The least, the last, the lost. You don't have to live like that is what she's trying to say. And there's a spirit and she's teaching the church of God Tower to commit whoredoms and fornication with other gods. And many of them are biting the bait. Many of them have done that. Many have done that. So Jesus hates four things against this God Tower church. Number one, they were permitting an out of order voice to speak behind a pulpit by the name of Jezebel. They let this woman do it. It wasn't as though she was doing it behind closed doors, covertly. You know, it was something in the open air. They let her stand up there and have this platform, and the pastor of that church was the one to blame. Because he let it go on. So it was an out of order voice that wasn't sanctioned by the Holy Ghost. Number two, they were permitting her to seduce God's servants to commit fornication. She was letting them know it's okay. Go ahead and do it and repent of it, but still come to church. And that way we can have the best of both worlds. Number three, she was permitting her, permitting her to seduce Christians to eat things, sacrifice to idols, when God specifically said, leave it alone. Amen. Don't go there. Don't fool with that. Mm -hmm. And she was letting them know, it's okay. Go ahead and do it. And then number four, tolerating her in spite of her impenitence. She didn't have a heart of repentance. Yeah. She wasn't about to give in and humble herself and ask Jesus to forgive her as she continued on in this false doctrine and teaching. And they continue to let her go on with that. Jesus said, I got a fix for her. I'm going to make a bed for her. And all, all those that sleep with her are going to fall in the same temptation of the bed that she's in. And she's going to die along with her children. Yeah. They're going to be cut off because God doesn't play with sin. Friendship with the world is like spiritual adultery to Jesus Christ. Again, let me say that friendship to the world is like spiritual adultery to Jesus Christ. Let that sink in. It's spiritual adultery to Jesus when you're friends of the world. We're in the world we have to live in. People like movies. We like to go to movies and see this and that. There's cursing in movies and sexual scenes and all this kind of stuff. This is the world we're living in. Yeah. It's like do or die. And, and, and certain things ought to convict you. Now, I know there's, all, there's rarely a movie that didn't have a curse word in it. Let's be really real about this. Every movie they have. And now they got homosexual and lesbian scenes in every movie almost now. Yeah. Every sitcom. Even commercials. It's everywhere. We don't, we, don't, we don't bash people that choose to go that way of lifestyle. If that's your way of doing it, you're still human just like everybody else is. Everybody else has their idiosyncrasies to deal with. You got yours to deal with, but I want you to understand you're dealing with an idiosyncrasy. It's not normal. And whether the devil makes you think it's normal or not, God never did sanction that. Now, you can still change. You can still ask for repentance. But guess what? We still love and still receive everybody because there are people that are straight that are messed up dealing with some issues and baggages. And it couldn't even be you. Say it, say it. So we can't be hating on anybody, but at the same time, you don't sit there and you can't condone the sin if God doesn't condone it. We're not here. Listen, when it comes to gays and lesbians, and I know a lot of people don't like pushing the issue because this, this thing is only going to get worse than what it already is. It's, it's going to be so normal now that everybody's going to be a part of it in a sense. Or they, they've got somebody in the family member or somebody that's close to them that has been touched by this particular thing. And I'm just letting you know, we're not bashing people of, you know, the LBGTQ com uh, community in any way, shape, or form because what joy, what privilege, what reward do I get out of bashing somebody doing something wrong? Yeah, yeah. We're simply telling individuals, though it seems natural and everybody has accepted it, don't go for that lie. It's like we're saying, hey, the bridge is out ahead. Please stop. We're saying it in love. Listen, the worst thing that can happen is if we're saying what we're saying and you're hearing this from preachers and Christians because most of the people of the LGBTQ community hate Christians a lot of times because they call us judgmental and why are they always down on us and stuff. Listen, we don't want to see you lose your soul and go to hell. We don't. We really don't. There's no joy in us telling you to stop that lifestyle. It's not like we're perfect. It's not like we got 
got it 100% together. This preacher is too busy in life trying to get himself together before he goes out and judges others. Yeah. I'm my worst critic. Yeah. I'm not perfect. Yeah. I don't know any ministers that are, but I can promise you this. I'm not purposely trying to commit sin either. Yeah. However, I do slip up and fall short every now and then. Because yeah. we're all struggling with something. Yeah. You may not be struggling with I'm with what I'm struggling with. I may not be struggling with what you're struggling with. But let me just say this, and I'll move on. If what ministers say and Christians say to the LGBT community as far as what you're doing is wrong, what if we are dead wrong in everything we say? All it means is we irritated you for a long time. That's the worst thing that can happen. But what if we're right? And hell is real. And the Bible even tells us that anybody that practices that lifestyle will go there. You don't believe it? Read Revelation 21 verse 8. The fearful, the unbelieving, the home office, adulterers, and it has a word in there, effeminate, which means sexual you know, orientation as far as gay lesbians, all that's covered. You know, it says they will die and have their part, which is, you, know, uh, you know, the lake of fire and brimstone and so forth. Which is the second death, the Bible says. All of those individuals. You know, the fearful, unbelieving, all of us, you know, it says that they're going to die and end up in the lake of fire and brimstone. So if the word of God is true and it irritates you to hear the truth, thank God you're able to hear the truth. Because some individuals miss the mark and end up in hell. We're saying this in love. And if this is the part, a part of who you are and you feel because... You know, you feel like this is so natural. Why don't you just take this challenge and just go before Jesus' presence and say, Father, if what I am doing is actually wrong according to what this preacher is saying and according to what your word says, if it's wrong, then Lord, I humble myself and ask that you show me that it is wrong. Simply do that. Amen. If it's a prayer from your heart, Jesus will show you the right way. If he doesn't and you continue on, then so be it. Simple as that. That's, that's the best way I can say it. Amen. Can I get an amen, somebody? Amen. Time to move on. We love you. I don't care if you're LGBTQ, trans, you know, pan, or whatever else they have out. Listen, we still love you because you're still human. Amen. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. Just like a heterosexual can be married and still have a little wife, a, a honey on the side. Or she could be straight and still got the milkman or the mailman over here on the side, the Amazon delivery man, man on the side over here. She and you and all of us who practice sin will be in the same boat. Doesn't matter your preference or anything. Sin is sin. And we're just simply trying to get people to live right. And here I am preaching this thing, trying to keep me straight. On the straight and narrow with the Lord Jesus Christ. So you got to understand, all of us are, 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 none of us are perfect. We've all sinned and fallen short. But listen, that's not an excuse because the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. If we couldn't strive to be perfect, why would God tell us that? Amen. We're to strive to be perfect every day. Well, nobody's perfect. Let's be real. None of us is See, we, we, because of that, we relax in it, and now it gives us a license to continue in our sin. But the Bible says, be ye perfect, which is, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Amen. So there were these four things that the church had to deal with. They had to deal with about this particular woman, uh, Jezebel. These four areas where, you know, they left it unchecked, unchecked permitting an out of voice uh, out of order voice to speak, permitting her to seduce the service of God to commit fornication and sacrificing to idols and uh, tolerating her spirit regardless of her not having a repentant heart. Now, let me talk to, little, to you a little bit about the Old Testament Jezebel, in case you don't know the story really quick. Jezebel in the Old Te Testament was a selfish, deceitful, manipulative, and a moral woman. She refused to worship the only one and true God Almighty and she led the entire country of Israel, the children of Israel. She led all of the children of Israel into sin. She married one of the most wicked kings that the Bible even talks about by the name of Ahab. She was the wife of this king Ahab and she caused the children of Israel to sin because she, Jezebel, was the woman that introduced Baal to the Israelites in the Old Testament. She came from a city called Phoenicia and uh, she worshipped 
these different gods, and she brought all of these gods to Israel. She was involved in the occult, witchcraft, whoredoms. She was the priestess of Baal. She was an adulterer. She participated in idolatry with very cunning, manip manipulative, and proud other individuals. And she uh, was disrespectful when it came to spiritual authority, and she rebelled against God's most prominent pop, uh, prophet, Elijah. She strongly rebelled against him. She hated prophets. She hated anything prophets stood for. This woman, in fact, would kill prophets like it was the order of the day. She was a fierce woman wanting to be feared in the natural. Ruthless. Diabolical. I mean, she was totally the worst of the worst. Satan personified through this person. That's who this woman was. You would fear Jezebel. Listen, do you remember the time when Elisha had to show down on the, you know, the, the hill and so forth where, he, where the false prophets of Baal, 450 of them, appeared and he had this contest to see which God was the real God and they were going to uh, offer two sacrifices and so forth and whichever God would answer by fire would be considered the God. Yes. When she did that, she showed these guys, uh, 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 Elisha, uh, Elijah showed these people up because when he prayed after that, the false gods prayed and worshiped you know, there are different gods, and the Bible says they were trying to dance around the altar, trying to, you know, get their gods to move, the gods of Baal to do something and move with the fire. And Elijah, Elijah just sat there bored, and then he said, hey, what's going on with your gods? Are they on a break? Are they on vacation? Did they leave the country? What's going on? He says, now, could you all move to the side and let me step up at the front plate now? And he called the God from heaven, the one and only El Elyon God. The God of the children of Israel, Almighty God, El Shaddai. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Somebody shout glory. Yeah. The King of kings, all kings. Yeah. Lord of all of us, the God of all flesh, God. Yeah. He says, now it's your turn, God, to show up and to show off. Yeah. He took the prop, he took the sacrifice and had them to put the sacrifice, you know, in different pieces on the wood and everything. And instead of him calling fire down, he said, look, I want you to take this thing a step further. Let's drench this sacrifice with water. He said, fill it with water. So they filled it up. Fill it with some more. Fill it up. That's not enough. Keep filling it. And they're looking at each other like, this is impossible. What kind of God is going to answer, first of all? Secondly, the thing is, so is soaking wet. A sopping wet with water. All of a sudden, he prayed that powerful prayer. Oh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, God, that never fit. He prayed the prayer, and the Almighty God came down. Woo! While we the fire came down from heaven, and it said it burned the sacrifice, and it lit Glory to God. Woo! The fire was thirsty. He licked up the water. And then he had those 450 false prophets killed. Then he walked away in victory. Everybody was shouting, bowing down to Almighty God. Until he got a letter from Jezebel. In this letter, Jezebel said, I heard what you did to my prophets. Consider yourself dead. This time tomorrow, because buddy, I'm coming after you. Oh, she didn't like that. She didn't like that at all. So you know what he does? The Bible says he, he went a day's journey away from that place, and he cried out to God, fearing and crying and going on like sat in the fetal position, almost sucking his thumb. Oh God, she coming to kill me. Take me, Lord. Take me, Jesus. God, take my life. Oh God. I'm the only one that didn't bow down, God. Nobody else but me. Now, if he really meant that prayer, all he had to do was just stay around because she would have taken his life for him. Because she was coming after him. And you better believe she wasn't going to stop until she had him dead. She would cut the prophet's heads off. This woman was ruthless. And he's asking God to commit suicide. Lord, take my life. God had to knock some sense in him and have him eat some bread and stuff for a 40 days journey. Because you got to understand, this woman was ruthless. The Bible says right here, and let, let me tell you something. She put hundreds of Baal prophets and priests on the payroll of the state. And she controlled Israel indirectly through her weak husband, Ahab. Yeah, yeah. He was the head of the whole thing, but she was indeed the neck. Turning that thing wherever he, she wanted it to go. She controlled that man's head. She was the neck. Whatever she said, 
He did. In fact, let me tell you what the Bible says in 1 Kings. This is the word of God. This is what the word of God says about this lady. <laughs> Listen to this, y'all. There was never a man like Ahab who, who sold himself to, the, to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. Listen, let me reread that. There was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. Good Lord of mercy. The Bible says that. In other words, he was the puppet. And she urged him on, and he did it. There was a case where there was a particular neighbor near the palace of where the king lived, and the king looked at that piece of little vineyard area. And he wanted, you know, he wanted, he wanted this particular vineyard. And uh, it belonged to a particular gentleman by the name of Naboth. Naboth said to the king, Sir King, with all due respect, you're the king and everything. He says, but I can't give you this land. I can't even sell you this land. This land is a part of my inheritance. This goes way, way back, generations. It's been passed down through every generation, generation, and I'll pass this on to my sons. My sons will pass it on to their sons and so forth and so on. And then the Bible says, the king walked away, upset and distraught. He's over there in the corner. All of a sudden, his wife, Jezebel, walks in the door. Looks at him and says, man of God, what's wrong with you? Not man of God, I'm sorry. But, 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 but king of Israel, what's wrong with you? And he looks, looks, lifts his head up and says, well, I tried to work a deal out with Naboth over there to give me his vineyard, but he, he, he didn't want to participate, and I'm a little distressed over the fact that I can't have that vineyard. She said, let me ask you a question. He said, what's that? Who are you? Well, what do you mean? Aren't you the king of Israel? Yes, I am the king of Israel. Well, doggone it, you need to act like a king. Let me take care of this thing. So she stepped into the picture. The Bible says she forged his signature and his seal, sent it out to the land where Naboth was from and had all the citizens and council people of that particular land go on a fast. And then she raised up two demonized individuals to lie against Naboth to say that Naboth cursed the king and he cursed God. And they took Naboth, an innocent man, to court. And he's up here trying to defend himself. And all these people are fasting to their gods of Baal. And they're fasting and so forth for this thing to happen. And these two scoundrels come up here and lie on this man and say, he lied to the king. He was disrespectful to the king. He was disrespectful to the gods and so forth. And they killed him. And then she comes to the king and says, that man you fear is dead. The land is yours, free of charge, it's yours. That's the kind of woman this lady was. And then the king owned the land. And God put it in Elijah's spirit for him to go to King Ahab and say to King Ahab, hey buddy, look what you did. You think you're gonna be able to get away with this? He says, God sees everything that goes on. He saw the whole thing. He says, let me tell you a little bit about death because it's coming for you. Not only are you going to die, but your wife is going to die. Y'all are going to die some ugly, horrendous deaths. She's going to die. Her body's going to be splattered. And the dogs are going to eat her alive. Yes. That's what Elijah prophesied would happen. Now listen to this. It says in verse 33. Well, let me read verse 30 of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. You don't have to turn there. Just listen. When Jezebel heard that Jehu, Jehu was the commander of Ahab, ended up being the king later on, but he was the commander, he, he was from a city of Jezreel. When Jezebel heard that Jehu had come to Jezreel, she painted her eyelids and fixed her hair and sat at a window. This is a window of the palace as the queen. She's sitting in the window. Jehu entered the gate of the palace and she shouted at him, how are you today, you murderer? You son, of, you son of Zimri who murdered his master? He looked up and saw her at the window and shouted, who's on my side? Two or three eunuchs looked out at him. He said, throw her down. Jehu said, throw her down. Check this out. So they threw her out the window and her blood splattered against the wall and on the horses. And she was trampled on by the horses with their hooves. And Jehu went into the palace for lunch. <laughs> Time to eat. 
Y'all yeah. hungry? Come on. Let's go eat. Let's go eat. Just, I mean, just brutally murdered the lady. Yeah. Threw out the window. She hit the wall going down. Body splattered all over everywhere. The horses and everything hit the hooves of the horses. The, ho the hooves, hooves of the horses trampled on the body. He went to eat lunch. And then he had a little conscience afterwards. He said, somebody go and bury that no crazy woman. She's the daughter of a king. But then when they went out to bury her, they found her skull, her feet, and her hands. When they returned, they remarked, this is, he remarked, this is just what the Lord said would happen. He told Elijah the prophet that the dogs would eat her flesh. And the dogs would sit there eating the flesh. And then her body would be scattered like manure upon the field so that no one could tell who it was. All that was left was the skull of this woman. Her hands and her feet. I said, Lord, I wonder why you just let that part be left over. God let me know in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 20. These six things that God hates, yea, seven are an abomination. Jezebel broke all seven of them. Listen to this. A proud look, a lying tongue, that's the head. Hands that shed innocent blood, those are the hands. Feet that be swift toward running to mischief, those are the feet. Head, hands and feet were the only thing left. And then there's some other things that are named here, it's seven of them. Let me close out with this real quick. I wanna to talk to you about the 10 characteristics of a Jezebel spirit. The 10 characteristics of a Jezebel spirit. Number one, this spirit seeks to gain popularity and favor with people of influential and high positions of leadership. You ever met anybody like that? Yep. Kissing up to leaders? Even famous people, they want to be just the fly on the wall of that person's house if they can. They'll sell their soul just to get a little piece of gratification, whatever they can find. They just want some body with strong influence. I see people on my Facebook page, they have videos here and there, and they have these different videos. Sometimes I look at two or three Darman videos, and this other guy that comes out with these videos, boy, they just touch my heart. Then I see some gold digging videos also, where guys just drive up in a certain kind of car, and they ask the girl for a date, and they, they curse the guy, get out of my face, this, that, blah, 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 blah. And then all of a sudden he says, well, come on, can I get your name? Can I get your phone? And then they're just fussing and going on. And then all of a sudden he says, all right. Then he just goes toward his car. Then they turn around and look at him. Ah, is, is that your car? That's your car? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's my car. Oh, that's, that's nice. That's nice. I just remembered. I, that apartment is not till tomorrow. What's the name? Wednesday? Yeah, it's Thursday instead of Wednesday. <laughs> you, you doing anything now? Can I go with you? I said, this, 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 this foolish woman sells her body and soul of a car, a piece of metal, because they want somebody of influence. And the devil's got them so blinded, they give themselves over material things that are here today and gone tomorrow. How vain can you get? How shallow can you get? And this is how, this is the society we live in today. And this is the spirit of Jezebel. It seeks to gain popularity and favor over people that have influence, they've influential in high positions of leadership. That has never, ever, ever been the way of the cross. You know, I've learned over the years that if you really want to be discovered by Jesus Christ, now listen to this, because I know some young preachers, young pro prophets and so forth, everybody wants to be discovered. So a lot of times they go to the big churches and they'll go to places, even small churches, where they know it's a new startup church so that they can get uh, close to the pastor to position themselves to be able to, you know, hear the word of God and so forth. But yet at the same time, pull out their credentials to let the pastor and the preacher know that, hey, I'm a person of influence. This is my gift. They want that gift to be used. So they're trying to rub shoulders with somebody that they know. But I've learned over the years, the way you get promoted is to literally Take the gift of God that you have. This doesn't make any kind of sense. Are y'all ready for this? Hide yourself. Well, what, what kind of sense? How they gonna know I got anything? Listen, hide yourself. Think about what said in Isaiah chapter 56. That God's ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my heart thoughts. As high as the heavens are from the earth, so are God's ways and our ways. Man's ways to try to get popularity and fame is to get with somebody influential. It's who you know. It's who you know. God's way 
days is to hide yourself. You got all this anointing, you got all this power, the world don't even know who you are, don't even know your name, don't know what you're capable of. Hide yourself. And when you hide yourself behind the closed doors, you're praying and seeking Jesus the whole time. God says these words, your gift will make room for you. Your gift will bring you before great people of influence. Your gift will bring you there. But it doesn't happen until you first hide yourself. And when you hide yourself, God exalts you. God will do that. God will do that. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 18, But when thou fasted, anoint thine head and wash thy face. You anoint your head with oil, then you wash your face. You, you wash your face right after you've anointed your head. You anoint your head, and then simply wash your face. So that thou mayest not appear unto men as to fast, but unto the Father, which is in secret. And the Bible says, the Father that seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees would have a little habit. They would go out in the public, and you see this big, giant, shiny mark on their forehead, dripping with oil. And that was a sign to let everybody know they had, had been fasting. See, they had what you, what you call false humility. And they were showing people that I'm holy, I'm righteous. Here I am struggling today. I'm afflicting my soul. I'm fasting unto the Lord. And they had these loud voices and be praying all these long, loud prayers. God says, when you go on a fast, I don't want anybody to know you're going on a fast. So this is what you're to do. You're to anoint your head with oil. Anoint it. Okay, check number one. And then wipe it away. What's the purpose of anointing it if it's going to be wiped away? Because I've seen that you've anointed it. And nobody sees this but me. I don't want anybody else to know you're fasting today because when they see that shiny dot on your head, they're going to know you're fasting, but I don't want them to know you're fasting. So you have anointed it unto me. Now, wash your face so that you won't appear unto men as unto fasting, but unto the Father which is in secret. And I, the Father, that seeth in secret, I'm going to reward you openly. I'm going to bring you to the front stage with the lights, the camera, and the action when you're ready. And when you're up there, you won't be up there. I'll be in you, up there through you. Because you'll be dead. And you won't be in your flesh trying to get glory. Amen. You'll be hidden, giving me the glory. Amen. That's the way God wants it. That's number one. That's the first thing. The second characteristic is this. That spirit will seek out other individuals they feel are weaker to become followers of them. If it, 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 it says that it gives the rejected individual a false sense of hope for its own selfish gain. They get the weak crowd, the weak people, the down and outers, low self-esteem to be followers. But it's not to bring them up and lift them up and to build them up. It's to make them look good. They, they want the numbers. And they want somebody pumping them up and lifting them up. It's not for anybody else. It's a selfish thing. It doesn't have anything to do with them. Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He's chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things that are mighty and the base things of this world to confound things which are despised. God has chosen these things to bring to naught these things which are, that no flesh would glory in his presence. Mark 10, 44 says, Whoever, whosoever of you will be the greatest or the chiefest, the strongest, the biggest, the number one, you, with me and you, be servant of all. But I'm the leader, Lord. Yep, you are the leader. I've chosen you to be the leader. Now, what do you do, leader? Listen to your marching orders. These are my marching orders. Wash your disciples' feet. But Lord, I thought I was going to be the one to go out here with the grapes being dropped in my mouth and the fan being fanned on me and people doing this and doing that, servants and stuff. Work. No, you're the, you're the servant. You're the greatest. You're the top one. You're the servant of all. You teach the rest how to do it because I had to do that myself. That's what Jesus is saying. And that's the way of the cross. That's the way of the cross. Number three, this spirit is never humble. It goes on to say, whenever the spirit receives praise, it always responds in false humility. You don't know what false humility is? Let me tell you what it is. False humility is prideful. <laughs> it's bragging of being humble. <laughs> Using the claim to manipulate or control. It seeks attention and admiration like the Pharisees who prayed loudly on the street corners so that people would know how righteous they were. 
The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 7, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. Yeah. Humble you and yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, yeah. that he might exalt you yeah. in due time. Yeah. Humble yourself, that he'll exalt you. Years ago, when I was at Word of Faith, there were other ministers there on staff, there and so forth. And a lot of times I felt like I had a word because God would always drop a word in my heart. My wife can attest to this. Mm -hmm. And I felt like this anointing was so strong and heavy, but I was like, Lord, I don't understand why you would put something in, in me. I'm not the pastor of this church. My bishop is the pastor of this church. God says, just chill out, John. hold on, hold on. So I, I, I collected all these sermons, all these messages, and I would put them down and write them out. And then God says, don't try to be somebody great. Don't go out here telling everybody how knowledgeable you are. You just teach this one little class. I had a class that I would teach called Foundations in Christianity. I taught that class for 25 years. And I just taught the class like it was a million folks. Sometimes it would be just a few. But I taught it like it was a million people. And I grew from it. It blessed me. And it turned around. Obviously, I found out it blessed a lot of other folks. But Bishop started asking me to minister messages. And I didn't have to scrounge and try to figure out what to minister because I already had all these sermons all lined up that God had been giving me because I hid myself. I wasn't trying to get his attention. He would call on me when I, I didn't even think I was ready. But when I got up there, obviously I was ready. Wow. I didn't know I was ready until I ministered the word. I knew this was God because I, as the messenger, felt the anointing come through me. Wow. And I said, this couldn't be me. So I couldn't go praise myself and pat myself on the back because God could put that same anointing on anybody. Yeah. And I was just humble that he chose me. But God said, hide yourself, Charles. Yeah. Don't be a bit trying to be seen, but hide yourself. And the more I would hide myself, the more my bishop would call and he go out of town, I'd minister, I'd minister, I'd minister a lot. And when we first started off, I was ministering so much, it was ridiculous. Amen. But it was because I was hiding myself. And my gift would make room for me. And it'll, it'll make room for you as well. So you have to have a humble heart, knowing that God can take that gift and move it on somebody else. Number four, it is a defense of the spirit, it is a defensive and combative spirit. When somebody confronts it, uh, you know, it goes off in a way of hiding something. This Jezebel spirit is defensive. And the Bible says in Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. He that is slow to anger and better uh, is better than he that is mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit better than he that taketh a city. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. If you can rule your own body and your own spirit, you're better than an Alexander the Great that can come in and conquer an entire city. If you can conquer you. So that's, that's the thing. Number five. It loves to teach and seeks to gain control in every situation. Let me say that again. That spirit of Jezebel loves to teach and gain control. Witchcraft is manipulation and control. Yes. A person that be, that literally uh, bewitches individuals is a person that is in a high position of control. Yeah. They're like a dictator. Yes. And it gets to a point where everything they say is law. Yeah, yeah. And they have manipulated the minds of individuals to yes. bow down to them somewhat. And if they ask you to drink cyanide, yeah. Kool-Aid, a lot of folk will drink cyanide, Kool-Aid, cool and, and, and commit suicide and don't even know it. Because after all, our leaders said to do so. Yeah. Because they've been bewitched or controlled by mind manipulation. Yes. And that's what that spirit would do. It's a Jezebel spirit. Mm -hmm. This spirit is male. It's neither male nor female. Or it's not just a female spirit. It's, it's, it's a, a, a double dual gender, uh, gender spirit. Male and female. It doesn't just mean because Jezebel was a woman that it, this spirit only works in women. It works in men and women. It's a spirit. Spirit has no gender. Right. So to work in a person that is vulnerable. Yeah. And then number six, it wants to be seen as the most spiritual and powerful one. Yeah. Typical loves to pray elaborate long prayers. Mm -hmm. Number seven, it will not submit to authority nor spiritual authority. Nope. It doesn't submit to governmental authority nor does it submit to spiritual authority. After all, I am the authority. Nobody's bigger, better, and higher than me. Yeah. It manipulates the person to think that they are self-contained and nobody's bigger than them. That is simply pride from the devil. That, my friend, is what got Lucifer kicked out of hell. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's the spirit of the Jezebel spirit that will come. That's the same spirit working in the church of Thyatira. All right. Now let me just say this. You know, the Bible says you have to obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves. You can't go forward until you learn to submit. To the degree you're willing to submit under somebody else's ministry is the degree that others will submit under the ministry God called you to walk in. But if you had a problem in submission, you're going to have a problem with others submitting to you. Because whatever man soweth, that shall he also reap. But when you learn to be a servant, God can use you to be a leader. He doesn't make, you're not born a leader, you're born a servant. And it's the greatest of all is the greatest servant of all. Because we're obedient unto the Lord. Number eight, it loves to pray and impart demonic spirits into others, especially in the church. Again, that's witchcraft personified. Number nine, it hates the voice of the prophets and it seeks to control and destroy those who operate in the prophetic. That's why she killed so many prophets of God while she was alive in the Old Testament. This woman went on a rampage killing folks. She was killing people left and right. There's a scripture that was talking about her and it said, you got to hurry up before Jezebel gets to you because she's already killed so many other prophets. She was on a rampage killing prophets, beheading many of them. And it hates the voice of the prophets because it's the voice of God. And it hates authority. And it thinks it's bigger and better than God. That is the devil himself. Yes. Yes. And then number 10, it, this spirit, it will never, it will never, it will never repent. Mm. Who does that sound like to you? Yes. Satan himself. <laughs> yes. It will never repent. That's why the devil can never be saved. Mm. Never be born again. Satan is already, he's past that stage, y'all. No hope for him at all. So he's trying to get everybody else to fall down under his power. Amen. Let's go on to verse 24 real quick. Verse 24 says, But unto you I say to the rest of thy tower, as many as have not this doctrine, which you have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already held, already hold fast until I come. In other words, the rest of you guys, the remnant that didn't bow down to this spirit of Jezebel in this church that listened to my words, that didn't give in, that didn't compromise, that didn't quit or get corrupted, that didn't get diluted or polluted, that held fast to my promises, though it was hard, though death were around you, though death came up to you, you still haven't done all the stand. You still stood anyhow. Yeah. I got something for you. You better believe when God has a blessing for you, it's going to be a blessing. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, I will give him the morning star. First of all, he says that they will rule the nations as Jesus Christ rules. This is during the millennium period of time where Jesus rules on planet Earth for 1,000 years and he judges individuals. We will be there as the church right next to Jesus judging individuals ourselves. You don't believe it? Read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. In the NIV version, it says, if any of you have a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly judgment instead before the saints? He says, don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And if you judge the world, how are we not competent to judge trivial cases? Because when we get our brand new bodies in heaven, we're going to be with Jesus judging the world. And then he says in verse 28, I'm going to give you a blessing. This is what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the morning star. Okay, the morning star is the star that was, you know, uh, right there when the sun would come up, right at the dawn, the crack of dawn, the, 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 right before the sun actually rose, you would see the morning star off to the north. That was the planet Venus. That was called the morning star. But in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, Jesus himself is referred to as the morning star. So Jesus is letting you know Hang in there. I'm going to give you all of me in my fullness of glory. Nothing to be held back. You're going to be in me. I'm going to be in you. We're going to be one with each other. You're going to be so woven together with me. We'll be one. If you hang in there and not give up. And you got to understand, God is 
Listen, there are no words to describe the awesomeness of God. We'll be one with our master, Jesus Christ. One with our perfect savior. He was the one perfect from the beginning. And when he came on planet earth, he was still perfect. Even unto the obedience of the death of the cross. He never missed a beat. And he's got a wonderful place waiting for us. And we're going to be reunited with him in oneness in a new body. I'll guarantee you we'll probably do some planet hopping. Galaxy hopping. We'll be going all, everything will be ours. We can probably travel by thought. You know, no more crying, no more dying. We're going to have a brand new body. Kids, you won't have to take a bath anymore. No more taking baths. Body be clean forever. In the sun. No more doing chores. Don't have to wash no more dishes. <laughs> Hallelujah. You go out in the mud and play in it all day, and then you come up looking, the mud will be gone. I mean, we're going to have a brand, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more dying, no more growing old, no more arthritis, no more cancer treatments, no more, you know, uh, kidney uh, dialysis, no more none of that stuff. When we get to heaven and glory, y'all, the streets won't be paid for something that looks like gold. It's going to be paid for sonic transparency. Right over here by uh, Love Boulevard, Love Avenue. All of us, I'm just going, listen, everything up there knows God. Everything up there praises God. The rocks cry out to him. The grass sings praises to God. Everything in heaven. Don't even have a need of the sun no more. Jesus, the sun, is going to be the sun. The light of God's glory. You got relatives that have died and gone on to be with the Lord. They're up there as I speak right now, looking over the battlements of glory, checking out what's going on on this side, saying, oh God, in time, they will be up here with us. And that's what awaits us if we simply pass the test down here. Yeah, we got to go through the mess down here and keep a straight face and put Jesus on our heart. Dethrone yourself. Let him be on the throne of your heart. Kick back, relax, and let him drive the wheel. Yeah, we'll be there together. Amen. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen. Amen.